Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. You may be seated. This morning, we are looking at our gospel reading in Luke. If you'd like to follow along, uh, you can look on page 869 in the black. There's some black Bibles in front of you if you want to use that, or if you brought your own Bible, we are in Luke chapter 11. This is the, uh, Jesus' teaching on the Lord's Prayer, called the Lord's Prayer, and uh, it is packed. I mean, it is absolutely packed. You could take each section and preach a whole sermon on it. And so I will start that today. We'll be here about three hours this afternoon, and no, we're not going to do that. It is packed, though, and I would recommend for further reading, J.I. Packer has a book called Praying the Lord's Prayer. If you're interested in studying this further, I would recommend doing that. But we're going to break this up into three sections this morning. Uh, one is an appeal. We'll see an appeal by the disciples. Next is a prayer where Jesus is teaching us how to pray. And then next is a, uh, a time of persistence, persistence praying. So let's dive in. Well, as uh, you see in the section this morning, Jesus is praying. Obviously, he was, doing, he was praying in a way that impressed his disciples because they asked him a question, Lord, would you teach us to pray? And I want to pause there on that first word, Lord, because what the disciples are showing is Christ's lordship over them. That means he is one who rules them. He is one they follow. And that should be an example to us that Christ is who uh, we sit under His Lordship. Christ is not just Savior, but He is also our Lord. Uh, I was talking to JC a week or two ago, and he was telling me about this trip to the Tennessee mountains that he made one fall, and uh, he and some friends were looking through. JC Bulliman is our student ministry intern, in case you're wondering. Um, and he was looking at some, uh, some foliage, you know, the, the leaves are changing, and J.C. is colorblind, and he said, all I could see was kind of a red, I'm not an expert on being colorblind, but uh, he said it was just kind of like he was seeing this red tint on everything, but uh, they had these really neat uh, viewfinders there that you could look out into the mountains that when you look through them, if you were colorblind, it allowed you to see all of the colors all of the colors that were in the mountains. And, well, that's what Jesus is as Lord. As we look at Him as Lord, that's like our viewfinder into everything else. It helps us to see all of the colors of everything else that we're going to read in uh, the Lord's Prayer this morning. And this wasn't uncommon for someone to ask their teacher, you know, who's also their rabbi, the disciples' rabbi, to ask them, will you teach us how to do this? And he does so, and he says, when you pray, say this. Now, there's another section in Matthew on the Sermon of the Mount where Jesus is also teaching this prayer. It's similar but a little bit different version where he says, uh, when you pray, pray like this. So in this prayer, he's, he's actually saying, when you pray, use these very words. See, when you pray the Lord's Prayer, use these very words words, which that's why we have it in our Eucharist this morning. Now, the Lord's Prayer is an excellent prayer to memorize. It is a great prayer for you to pray with your children or grandchildren or friends. If you're a person who says, you know, I, I just don't like to pray in public. If you're ever asked to pray, then you can just pray the Lord's Prayer. I had a friend, uh, he's a pastor in North Carolina, and he said, when I was in seminary, we had a class, and every I don't know, maybe a New Testament class, the professor would say, I want you to pray, and I'm going to grade you on your prayer. <laughs> and so every, uh, every, you know, he would pick a different student each class, and each student would pray, and he would kind of give a critique about their prayer. And one day, a, a student just prayed the Lord's Prayer, and that was it. And he said, perfect, no criticism. <laughs> so this is a prayer that you uh, can memorize and say. Maybe you're in Food Lion and someone uh, is struggling with something and you say, can I pray for you? And you're not someone who likes to pray and then you can just pray the Lord's Prayer for them. So it's very accessible 
And this is a prayer that uh, gives us a plethora of instructions. He says, when you pray, pray this. And he says, Father. This encompassing prayer starts with Father. And the word Father there means Abba. And Abba means Daddy. It's like uh, a child saying, you know, to their, to their father, Daddy, 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 Daddy. I saw this when I was in Israel. Uh, we were staying at this little camp, and there were um, folks who were on holiday uh, from Israel there, obviously. And, you know, I remember this one specific time, this child running to his dad and going, Abba, Abba, Abba. And it just clicked in my head. It's like, ah, that's what it looks like, is that we have a, uh, a father in heaven who miraculously tells us to call him uh, Daddy. And the reason why that's miraculous is because of the next few words, hallowed be thy name, because he is holy. He is a holy God who tells us to call him Daddy. He is a holy God that, uh, you know, the word hallowed means to reverence, uh, to, to call someone holy. And so this holy God is asking us to call him daddy, father, hallowed be thy name. And so we reverence his name. And it also reminds us that, as uh, one commentator said, God shall be God that man shall not whittle God down to a manageable size and shape. So although he is daddy, we don't get to make him to be who we want him to be. We hallowed his name. We don't make him like us. He makes us like him. He does not submit to how we want him to be, but we submit to how he wants us to be. And then he continues, you know, as we are submitting uh, to in reverencing his name, we ask, to, you know, how, your kingdom come. Now, what does that mean, your kingdom come? Uh, uh, Albert Muller, uh, one theologian, said this, it means nothing more and nothing less than may Christ establish his kingdom soon. And what that means is that, that all would come under his rule and authority. His rule and authority. And when we come under His rule and authority, then we're praying, Thy kingdom come and Thy will be done. And there's no better model for Thy will be done than the Garden of Gethsemane, where Jesus is praying and He says, Father, if You are willing to remove this cup from me, nevertheless, not my will, but Yours be done. So this is at the point where Christ is getting ready to go to the cross. He knows that it's the Father in heaven's will for him to go to the cross. And we see his humanity saying, you know, if I, if I cannot do this, I would rather have that done. But thy will be done. That is a much, uh, it's, it's much easier for me to say up here than it is to experience that sometimes. To say, Lord, I want your will to be done, but I do not understand this. I don't see this. I don't like your decision. And the good news is because he's Abba that we can say those things to him. But uh, I'm going to believe that in the long run that uh, the way this will work out will be good. And so we remember that he is our sustenance in that. That's why we ask in the next section, give us our daily bread, that he is our spiritual, our emotional, our, uh, he provides literally our bread, our food, and that we are utterly dependent on him. Theologian Leon Morris says, we are in a constant state of dependence on God. Thus we say, give us our daily bread, give us our sustenance as we follow your will. Sustain us. Because if we're if we're praying for God's will and we can't see the future, I know that for me, it, it reminds me of, it feels out of control sometimes. And, and, and it, it brings me to my knees to say, Lord, will you, I just, for today, give me my bread 
for today. Give me this daily bread today, you know, emotionally, spiritually, all of these that I need. Give me your daily bread. And then he moves to this relationship uh, with others and with God. He says in verse 4, and forgive us our sins as we forgive the, everyone who is indebted to us and lead us not into temptation. Forgive us our sins. Uh, Martin Luther said that the Christian life is a life of repentance and faith, repentance and faith, repentance and faith. So da we're daily repenting. It does not mean that we're daily losing our salvation and then gaining it back. He's not saying that at all. He's just saying that daily we fall short of the glory of God and daily we're called to uh, repent, to acknowledge that. That's why we have confession on Sundays. It's not just so it sounds happy and good. That's why we have confession on Sundays, that we might be repenting daily. If you, uh, you know, there's these red books in front of you, the Book of Common Prayer. I don't think I have one in here, but there's a Book of Common Prayer. And if you're familiar with the Anglican uh, heritage, then uh, in Anglicanism we have something called daily prayer where that if you choose to do daily prayer, you know, it's just prayers daily. It's very helpful. It's a great rhythm. If you, uh, if you go to our website and look on uh, references or church or recommended websites, uh, it'll have a daily prayer uh, that you can listen to as well. And it's just a good way to pray every day. And in that is the Lord's Prayer. Or we're daily remembering that He provides us our bread, that we are fully dependent on Him uh, to provide us our bread, and we fully see that we need His forgiveness every day. Forgive us our sins. For we ourselves forgive everyone who is indebted to us. And so that's the call of the Christian, that we might also, because of God's uh, great mercy and grace to us, that we would forgive and show mercy and grace to others. Easier said than done, right? If you've ever had bitterness or a broken relationship with someone where it requires forgiveness, it's much easier said than done. And so again, it calls us to cry out to God to say, God, you, if I'm going to forgive, I'm relying on you. you got to teach me how to do that. And I think a lot of that comes in community as well, in community with one another, that we learn how to do this. And then we meditate on how much we've been loved and forgiven, and it allows us to forgive others. It reminds me of uh, Matthew 18 is the parable of the unmerciful servant. There's this servant who owns, owes his boss like this ridiculous amount of money, and then the boss just forgives him, forgives his debt completely. And then the next day, there's someone that owes that servant money, and that servant says, you pay me right now. And you know why he did that, because he forgot how much he had been forgiven. So when we remember how much we have been forgiven, it allows us to enter in and forgive others as well. And that we might not be tempted to not do that. And then the last section here is persistence, which is a, uh, it's just, a, the, the parable is so interesting to me, because it's a parable about uh, someone who comes and knocks on, you know, Jesus says, you know, if your friend came and knocked on your door at night, uh, you'd get up and give him some food. But he says, he, the, he gives the parable and says, the man doesn't give him food because he's his friend. Why does he give him food? Because he's persistent. I would think it would be because it's my friend. Hey, but he's persistent. So God is teaching us that he wants us to be persistent in praying this prayer. Persistent over and over again that His will would be done. But the encouragement in the passage is the last bit where He reminds us who we are asking. That we have a good Father that we are asking who's going to give us good gifts. It may not be the gift that I would have chosen if I would have written the script, but he promises that he will give us good gifts. When he says, What father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will instead give him a serpent? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? 
If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? So we ask for the Holy Spirit that God's kingdom might advance, that we might forgive others, that we might have a counselor to sustain us, and that God might be glorified. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen.